<laughs> the game world is a small garden. The player must explore everything in the garden to experience the game, Shigeru Miyamoto said. He was speaking to Nintendo Power in July of 2000, just ahead of the release of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. He continued, It's the same idea behind all Mario and Zelda games. But in Majora's Mask, we limited the time span to three days so that players would have to learn everything that happens in the world during that time. To save the world, they must know where and when everything happens. This is Legendary Adventures, a Legend of Zelda playthrough podcast. We have saved the world. Majora's Mask was defeated, the moon dissolved, Termina is no longer in danger. So this week we're going to take a look at the world and legacy of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Part 1. The Center of the Map The world of Termina is divided into seven distinct areas. At the center of it all is Clock Town. This is the central hub of the adventure. Clock Town itself is subdivided into five areas. In the center is South Clock Town. This is the hub to reach all other areas of the city. And at the center of South Clock Town is the Clock Tower, located at the center of everything. This is the ultimate goal of the game. Players will start each three-day cycle at the base of the Clock Tower, and they will walk around it to reach other areas of Clock Town, keeping the Clock Tower in the forefront of the players' minds. To the southwest, we find the Laundry Pool. This location is most important to the Anjun Cafe quest, but we also acquire the Bremen Mask here, and we can find a stray fairy at certain times of day. The remainder of the west side of Clock Town comprises the aptly named West Clock Town. There is a shopping district with the curiosity shop, general store, bomb shop, bank, dojo, post office, and lottery shop. North Clock Town is the least developed part of the city. It's home to the Great Fairy's Fountain, a Deku minigame, and the leader of the Bomber's Secret Society of Justice, Jim. East Clock Town is perhaps the largest of the five sections of Clock Town. It's sort of a second business district. It's home to the Mayor's Office, the Stockpot Inn, the Milk Bar, and three minigame shops. Clock Town is easily the largest and most dense town or city we've seen in a Legend of Zelda game to this point. Its residents move about their daily schedules like clockwork, fitting for where they live. Yoshiaki Koizumi was primarily in charge of creating Clock Town, its inhabitants, and the time-based events of the game. In an interview translated on Glitterberry's game translations, Koizumi said, I created realistic lives for the characters. Aonuma chimed in and said, You could say that Koizumi slapped his worldview on the whole thing, and he laughed at that. Koizumi then added, I put everything I've seen in my 30-something years on this earth. Clock Town is easily the most realized and most real-feeling town or city we've seen in a Zelda game yet. It may also be the best realized city in a Zelda game ever. While the characters move through their days like clockwork, it feels natural because of the three-day system. The way the characters move through the world and their days only help establish Clock Town as feeling like a real place, but it's only part of a larger world. Part 2, The Wider World Just outside the walls of Clock Town, we come to the second distinct area of the game, Termina Field. Similar to Hyrule Field in Ocarina of Time, we can use Termina Field to reach all other areas of the game. It's built around Clock Town and is designed to resemble a compass. Termina Field is circular with exits to other areas at each cardinal direction there's a fifth exit to the southwest point. In terms of elevation, I feel that Termina has less variation compared to Hyrule Field. There is a raised area near Clock Town, but the entrances to other regions generally sit below this raised area, and there's generally not a whole lot of variation in elevation in these lower areas. What does vary greatly is the appearance of each area. Just beyond the drop-off of the grass to the north, players will find a snowy plain with large mushroom-shaped rocks. To the west, they find beachy sand. To the south, the greenery of a swamp with trees and tall grass. And to the east, the dead stone of Akana. Termina Field is much more compact than Hyrule Field, and it packs in a whole lot more to do in that space. The developers themselves noted the increased density. 
In the interview translated on Glitterary's game translations, Zelda series co-creator Shigeru Miyamoto said he wanted the game to be dense. He said, It's useless to make something that the audience just skims over in one viewing, like a movie. The full flavor of a creation gradually emerges with each viewing, as all the subtleties reveal themselves. That's what we're aiming for. It's something I've always strived towards. Koizumi then added, We knew Miyamoto had always been saying how he wanted to make a short Zelda. That could be a reference to the development of Ocarina of Time. In the early stages of the project, Miyamoto talked about limiting the game to Ganon's castle. Ocarina of Time kept growing, however, in part because Miyamoto himself wanted to add horse riding to the game. The denser, more compact world of Majora's Mask wasn't just an artistic consideration, however. It's a practical one. In a 2009 Iwata Asks interview, A.G. Aonuma said, At first, we absolutely had no idea what sort of thing we were supposed to make, and we just kept expanding our plans. At that point, the three-day system, the idea of a compact world that could be played over and over again, came down from Miyamoto-san and the other director, Koizumi. We added that to the mix, and then finally we saw the full substance of a Legend of Zelda game that we could make in one year. Another factor in the game's density is the decision to give players only three days before they have to start the loop over again. Both Aonuma and Koizumi stated that their original plan was for a full week. Aonuma said they decided to go with three days because it was too difficult to remember everything to do in that one week in-game time span. He also attributed the change, at least in part, to the limited development time that they were granted. In an Awada Ask interview, he said, We felt it would be best to make it a three-step process, and we compressed all sorts of things we'd planned over a week into three days. To give an idea of how much the density of the world map has been increased, consider that there are at least two non-player characters on Termina Field. That's double the number seen in Ocarina of Time's Hyrule Field. There's also a building located outside of Clock Town in the form of the Astral Observatory. It's on the east side of the field, slightly south to the entrance of Akana. We can access this building from both inside Clock Town and outside. There are 11 hidden grottos to find, up from 8 in Ocarina of Time, and 3 treasure chests. There weren't any in Hyrule Field in Ocarina of Time. Termina Field is also filled with enemies. There are birds, bats, choo-choos, dodongos, levers, and more. On top of that, which enemies the players find on Termina Field vary depending on the time of day. For example, birds and Deku Babas are found near the swamp during the day. At night, they're swapped for bats and the floating skull enemies known as bubbles. It's a nice use of the day and night system and a way to increase the number of enemies that players will encounter in the world. While Yoshiaki Koizumi generally headed up the design of Clock Town, Eiji Aonuma was generally in charge of the areas beyond Clock Town. In an interview on Glitterberry's game translations, Koizumi suggested the design of the larger overworld was intended to contrast with Clock Town. He said, Aonuma was in charge of the outdoors, and when he saw how serious my town was, he made his areas of the game more lighthearted. Now that's not to say that everything is bright and cheery beyond Clock Town, and that everything within Clock Town is dour. That's not true. It is true that the stories inside Clock Town are generally more personal, and outside they're generally more grandly heroic. Aonuma said, I tried to emulate the fantasy atmosphere we had in Ocarina of Time, but it's clear that there is still sadness throughout the world of Termina. Link has three primary transformation masks, each represent a character who has died, and regret is an emotion that is often expressed by the characters. There are four regions located at the four main compass points. They are the Snowhead Mountains to the north, the Swamp to the south, the Great Bay to the west, and Ikana to the east. Each of these regions contains a dungeon, additional settlements, a great fairy fountain, mini games, and challenges. Both Snowhead and Ikana Canyon feature highly vertical spaces with significant changes in elevation, while both Great Bay and the Swamp feature less in terms of vertically designed spaces. The Swamp is perhaps the flattest area, while Great Bay does get some additional variation through its above and below water areas. Each of these areas also has an unsalt and salt version, determined by whether or not the boss has been defeated. The Swamp to the south and Snowhead to the north change the most dramatically after their bosses are defeated. The poisoned water of the swamp clears, and the snow melts on the mountain, bringing back spring. However, the changes to Great Bay in Akana are not dramatic. I can't say that I really noticed any myself, but I understand an additional minigame opens in Great Bay, as well as the opportunity to practice on stage with the band in Zora Hall. I did not participate in either. In Akana, it seems that just the lighting changes and the Gibdo disappear.
there is one additional exit from Termina Field to the southwest. This is Milk Road. It contains the Gorman Brothers racetrack, Romani Ranch, the Hen House, and the dog racing track. While the rest of the map seems largely symmetrical, Milk Road sticks out as being the only location between two points of the compass, and the only location without a dungeon. This is because it was added later in development. As I mentioned previously in the season, it was added specifically to host the alien encounter at the ranch. Aonuma told GameSpot in 2015 there was a UFO boom happening in Japan at the time, so he thought it would be fun to include in Majora's Mask. Koizumi wanted to incorporate this idea into his section of the game, but in a 2015 interview with Nintendo Dream and translated on Nintendo Everything, Aonuma said there just wasn't enough room in Clocktown for the alien invasion scenario. Therefore, we wanted to have a vast place like a ranch, Aonuma said. Also, it would have been weird if there wasn't a ranch following Ocarina of Time, so Romani Ranch was born. All in all, I feel like this map is fairly well balanced. The map of Ocarina of Time felt heavily weighted to the east, but that's not the case here. If there's one region I spent less time in than the others, it's Ikana. But in general, my adventure brought me back to each area more than once. If one area feels more weighted than the others to me, I would say it's Snowhead. The changes are more dramatic and obvious. I can more readily identify items and quests that I skipped over in Snowhead that I could go do if I wanted to challenge the boss again. The obvious compass design of the world is not my favorite. I think it contributes to determine a feeling less organic, less like an actual place. The abrupt changes in climate at each compass point contributes to this. On the other hand, the game does well to justify the world design within its story. The time elements of the game also help flesh out Termina in a way that gives it a feeling like a real place. The way the characters in Clocktown and other areas maintain schedules is a nice touch that helps breathe life in the space. There's less of that in the regions beyond Clocktown, but it's not completely absent, and the characters are impacted by player action through completing quests and defeating bosses to bring some changes to the region. On the whole, I think it works. Termina is, in my opinion, a solid world. It's fun to play through and full of life. Part 3. The Legacy of Majora's Mask Majora's Mask marked the first time the Zelda series used assets from a previous title to make an all-new Zelda game. It would not be the last. Speaking to IGN in June of 2000, Shigeru Miyamoto said, Gamers like the fact that we use a familiar engine, don't you think? I believe that the gamers won't feel as if they are playing on an old engine. As a matter of fact, when it comes to game design, we've come up with many new ideas. And in the future too, once we've established a 3D action game engine, we may use it again. A number of games in the series were also made reusing assets from a previous game. That includes the next two entries in the series, Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons, which were both built from the assets of Link's Awakening, Spirit Tracks, which is built from the assets of Phantom Hourglass, and Tears of the Kingdom, which is built from the assets of Breath of the Wild. Majora's Mask also seems to be the pivot point to a single director system within the Zelda series. Ocarina of Time had five directors who seemed to be roughly equal. With Majora's Mask, Shigeru Miyamoto stated that Aonuma was the supervising director over the project, though in the end credits, Koizumi is co-credited with Aonuma as a game system director. Both also acknowledged that Koizumi was over the design of Clocktown, while Aonuma was over the rest of the world. Speaking to Denfa Minico Gamer in 2017, Aonuma said, Well, there were many directors until The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. After that, it became a one-director system. I don't feel that Majora's Mask really adds anything to the general lore or the world-building of the Zelda series as a whole. As with Link's Awakening, it tells a story outside of Hyrule which doesn't feature Zelda or Ganon. It's maybe a solidification that these types of stories are at home within the Zelda series. Few new characters were introduced in Majora's Mask. I would say, however, of the recurring characters that were first introduced in Ocarina of Time, such as the Chicken Lady and the Carpenters, they seem to be better remembered for their appearance in Majora's Mask. It's not uncommon to hear fans call those characters by the names that they were given in Majora's Mask. So, for example, the Chicken Lady is generally referred to as Anju, even applying the name retroactively and using the name Anju when talking about Ocarina of Time's Chicken Lady. Of the new characters who do make their first appearance here, Tingle stands out the most. He not only became a recurring character in the series, but starred in two spin-off games. Majora's Mask also introduces a number of items and mechanics that will be iterated on as the series continues. 
For example, it is the first game in the series to introduce a flying mechanic, and the first to have a character other than Link playable for a brief section. A flying or gliding mechanic is probably most famously featured in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, but we'll also see variations on the idea in titles like The Wind Waker, The Minish Cap, and Skyward Sword. While titles like The Wind Waker, Phantom Hourglass, and Spirit Tracks will allow players to take control of characters other than Link. Majora's Mask was also the first time where I encountered a Groundhog Day-style time loop as a key gameplay component. The concept wiki on Giant Bomb wasn't much help because it includes games that have stories which revolve around time loops, such as the original Final Fantasy. The story is a loop, but the loop itself doesn't factor into the gameplay in the same way as it does in Majora's Mask. Players are not constantly resetting time at will to go through a loop over and over again. There are also games listed that I'm not familiar with, and I can't tell from the description if they use a loop in the way that Majora's Mask does. I suspect there may be another game or two that uses a true Groundhog Day-style time loop prior to Majora's Mask, but I think Majora's Mask may be the most famous example of the concept. In recent years, we've seen an explosion in time loop games. I personally haven't played any of them. But the developers of titles like The Sexy Brutal, Outer Wilds, and Elsinore all said that they were directly inspired by Majora's Mask. The Zelda series, however, hasn't returned to the time loop concept. We've never seen anything quite like Clock Town again. I feel that there are echoes of Clock Town in places like Windfall Island in The Wind Waker and Skyloft in Skyward Sword. Echoes, but none of them truly embrace the unique gameplay mechanics of Clock Town. In terms of non-player characters truly following a time-based schedule, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom perhaps come the closest. Characters in those games maintain schedules which are carried out in real time. In 2015, Game Informer asked Aonuma why the Zelda team never returned to the mechanics of Majora's Mask. He said, I guess one way to address that is, when you're thinking about time as an element of gameplay, we really did all that we set out to do here. And to a certain extent, that's true with the masks as well. Because we so fully realized our ideas and how to use those themes in-game, we felt like we were done with it, and we were ready to move on to new ideas afterwards. We didn't feel the need to use those exact ideas in other games beyond that. Aonuma did say, however, that it was interesting to return to those ideas while working on the remake. Game Informer followed up by asking if the time manipulation elements could return in future games. Aonuma responded, One particular game element, being able to slow down the passage of time, I think that's something that we may be able to revisit in the future. But if we do so, it would be to implement it in a different way. It would have to be different to be meaningful. So that's something you might see again in the future. It's no secret that the Zelda team had to crunch to complete The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. I discussed in the first episode of this season how the team generally worked until 10 p.m., with English scriptwriter Jason Lung stating that he was putting in 15 hours or more a day while he was on the project. Majora's Mask wasn't the first Zelda game where developers had to crunch. I think we can safely say it had been a part of the development of the series from the beginning. In the first season of this podcast, I mentioned how composer Koji Kondo pulled an all-nighter to create a new arrangement of his overworld theme for use on the title screen of the original game. He talked about it in a 2016 Nintendo interview celebrating the 30th anniversary of the game. Likewise, in a 1992 interview about A Link to the Past and translated on Shmopulations, Miyamoto talked about the crunch for that game. He said, During development, I worked so hard that people asked me, what are you going to do when your body gives out since you never go home? But I always ensured that I got 8 hours of sleep a day so that my brain doesn't get tired. He added, I also made sure the programmers were taking time off to sleep. Work never progresses if you don't get any sleep. But while it's important to get some rest, it's also not good to have people saying, well, it's 5pm, I'll see you guys tomorrow. If someone prances out of the door right at 5pm, while everyone's still at work, the reaction will be, who is this guy? He laughed. Link's Awakening was started as an after-hours project. And while I never saw any comments specifically mentioning overtime when talking about the development of Ocarina of Time, the developers frequently talked about how hard it was to make that game. So what really is different about Majora's Mask? Well, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure, but I suspect Majora's Mask's year-long development time likely added more pressure to the developers. All previous games in the series were multi-year projects, and I doubt the developers were crunching that entire time. Again, I can't say for sure, and I don't know that the developers gave enough details to say for sure, but I can say at the very least in the instance of Koji Kondo and the all-nighter he pulled, that only came about as they approached Deadline, and they needed a new title theme because of copyright reasons. 
I can also say the developers were mostly positive about their experiences developing the previous games. Former Nintendo CEO, the late Satoru Iwata, seemed surprised by this when he interviewed the team about Ocarina of Time. Speaking to Shigeru Miyamoto in a one-on-one -on -one interview in 2011, he said, Everyone talked about it so happily that I wondered if over the last 13 years they'd simply forgotten all the hardship. He then asked how the making of the game was for Miyamoto, and he replied, It wasn't hard for me either. For Majora's Mask, on the other hand, the developers frequently talk about the development being hard. With Eiji Onuma saying that he was up against the edge the entire time, I bring this up because I believe Majora's Mask is a step towards Nintendo working to reduce crunch among its employees. I don't think it disappeared right away after Majora's Mask, and I can't say for sure that it doesn't happen at Nintendo today. However, Nintendo reps have in recent interviews talked about how they work to reduce crunch. In a 2023 interview with Inverse, current Nintendo of America president Doug Bowser was asked about crunch. He responded by talking about Super Mario Bros. Wonder. I'm always careful not to comment on the part of developers, he said. But in general, what Mr. Tezuka has noted is that very early on in the development cycle, he really did want to give the team freedom to explore a variety of ideas. The result was a lot of unique and creative ideas that they could think about without the pressure of a deadline or the pressure of how do I actually bring this to life. One thing with Nintendo development is we don't pressure our teams to deliver within a certain window. If they need more time, they'll take more time. But the reason for that is our players have an expectation of the quality that our games will bring. We want to make sure that we respect that and deliver those wow moments. Again, to be clear, Bowser can only speak from their perspective as a Nintendo of America president. They're not directly over the developers. Eiji Onuma, however, is. Speaking about Majora's Mask in a conversation published on Denfa Minico Gamer in 2017, he said, If you ask me to make that kind of game again, I can't do it. Further, I think it would be hard to make a game in a realistic sense if you are so much involved in a chaotic environment. So I realize that if you want to keep making games that people can relate to, the producers need to have a balanced life outside of the company. Thanks for listening to this episode of Legendary Adventures Podcast. Majora's Mask is complete. I plan to tackle Oracle of Ages next, but we're not going to move on from Majora's Mask quite yet. I feel I need a little more time to work on the next season to make sure that I stay on my weekly schedule. So I've put together a couple of Majora's Mask related bonus episodes. I hope you enjoy them. If you haven't already and you want to follow along, please subscribe. To everyone who has already subscribed, you are awesome. Thank you for joining me on this little project of mine. I am Paul Riley, and I will see you next week. Music